Uh, hello, thank you so much for joining us this evening and a very special welcome to all our Tree Council supporters and to our volunteer tree wardens. My name is Sarah Lom and I'm CEO of the Tree Council and I'm here this evening with my colleague Louise Bow. Louise, put your hand up, who's project manager for Talk to the Hedge and Dominic, who's hiding behind the dark screen, <laughs> who's our comms and policy officer who's helping with all things digital this evening. And of course, we have our fantastic panelists, panelists uh, that are, who I will introduce in, the, in just a second. For those of you who don't know the Tree Council very well, we're a national charity that brings everybody together for the love of trees. And this week, we're delighted to be celebrating the first ever National Hedgerow Week, which we uh, are working on with five charity partners. And it's thanks to funding from government's Green Recovery Challenge Fund. The aim is to raise awareness of all the amazing things that hedges do for us, not only in the countryside, but also in our cities. We want you to notice hedges. We'd like the nation to benefit from bigger, healthier, better connected hedgerows. And we'd like to provide more information on how to care for hedgerows and all the precious wildlife that they support. So thanks to our successful uh, green recovery bid, we not only have National Hedgerow Week, we're also going to plant 53 kilometers of new hedgerow and look after it once it's planted, 2,650 hedgerow trees and train 10 new apprentices. On top of that, we're going to create a brilliant new knowledge hub with guidance on hedgerow management for farmers, local authorities and homeowners. So you can imagine when we heard that author and publisher Eleanor Mannion had written a fabulous new story called The Happy Hedgerow, she became the perfect guest to invite to join our Hedge Talk webinar series, along with this evening's other panellists, illustrator Erin Brown and bookshop owner Alison Cameron. Between them, they have a vast knowledge and experience of the world of children's fiction. They know how to fire up the imagination of young readers with words and images. And that cultural side of hedgerows is just as important as all the environmental and biodiversity benefits that they bring. So it now gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Alison Cameron, owner of a, of a small and very successful independent community bookshop in Buckinghamshire. Alison also has experience as a school governor at a local primary school, and she's a parent. She's going to set the scene for us a little, give us the bigger picture before we dive into the detail of the happy hedgerow. So over to you, Alison. Lovely. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm absolutely delighted to be part of uh, the exciting event tonight because um, I've certainly noticed over lockdown and even prior to lockdown that there is a genuine interest in nature which is driven by children. So to give you a bit of background, I used to work in the private sector um, and having my first son 15 years ago, I started helping a friend in this bookshop in Buckingham based on the campus of the university. And around five years ago, the lease became available and I took over an independent bookshop and it's been an absolute dream come true for me. And what I've done is develop the children's side of, of the business and uh, it's it's fantastic. We're seeing brilliant books coming through more and more year on year and more to do with nature. So what we saw when lockdown started was customers were generally spending more time outside and they also had more time to come into an independent bookshop. And what we found was particularly being led by the children, a general interest in their world around them. I think we've seen lots of books and uh, teaching around global environmental issues, but actually what I found was people were exploring their local area, their local farmlands, and we're starting to ask questions about what was going on there. What was the biodiversity? What animals would they see and how could they preserve it? Um, so also we've seen working with the local primary schools that the, the local environment is very strongly on the curriculum. And that's something that's come through lockdown. And we've also worked with primary schools where nature is embedded in the curriculum. It's the ground, 
on which they they grow all the other learning from and that again is led by the children which is really encouraging and we also find that the parents are now learning through the children they're looking at the books the children pick up and I've certainly found if there's a subject I don't know a lot about a children's book is a great way in because they're so beautifully written the illustrations are engaging there's just enough information for me if I'm learning about it and it, it's a wonderful time to share and it also buys you that time to sit down and share something that's really important um, so we've seen we've seen books like this coming out and we've seen books that are very detailed in their illustrations. Um, the books feel very natural, matte pages, no plastic. Uh, they're very tactile. They're nice to pick up and spend time with. Um, and we've seen all sorts of areas covered. So there's some fantastic books about trees, about climate change, about environmental issues. But we we did notice when we, we got asked to be part of this that there wasn't a book about a hedgerow. Um, and yet it seems such a wonderful setting to have for a book because so many magical things happen in there and mm -hmm. children play a lot around hedgerows and spend time with them. And, you know, we walk past and drive past thousands of them, but we don't seem to have had a vehicle to understand a little bit about them. So this is why this book is going to be absolutely fantastic. Mm. <laughs> I think that's so true what you say about people now looking uh, very much they've got to know their local neighborhood through walking um, and, and so on and so forth and they feel mm. much more nature connected I mean have have um, book sales gone up um, in, in a way that, that that's a big trajectory on nature connectedness that things to do with nature and the environment yeah, I, I genuinely feel they have. I think that the two upturns we've seen in children's books are diversity. Children want to see lots of different people. They want to see themselves in books. So we've seen a real upturn in that. But I would say the majority has been uh, in books about the environment, about the natural environment, about the place people live and play and spend time and go to school uh, so we've probably seen a good 30 percent um uptake in those books and we're constantly looking for new ways of delivering that and i think you'll you'll see it in books like michael mapergo a very well-known author even he has brought out a primary school age book which is all about nature so he's recognizing that that's what the reader wants now um, and it's really heartwarming. And we've even seen um, some of the classic books, more sales of the classic books that are set with children outside having adventures um, in their little groups, solving mysteries. But they're all set in the natural environment, which is really encouraging because what we we do find is although climate change is you know right up there and thinking of ways to reduce plastic and save the environment, we have had parents in that have said that is a big anxiety for the children they read a lot about climate change and they feel very responsible but it actually causes them stress because they feel quite helpless mm. whereas the books that are set locally they think actually well we can do no mo may we can make sure the the garden outside is set to welcome bees and other insects and i think it empowers them and makes them feel actually i can as one individual make a change and that's why books that are set locally are, are almost more powerful than the ones that are a global setting yeah interesting yeah it's definitely mm. the, the climate anxiety is something that we're coming across very strongly in our uh program with schools um the young tree chans and so on and the fact that they feel they can uh make a, a, even a small difference is is really helpful for them and now one question i wanted to ask mm. you is you know if you're a parent yes. or a grandparent and you walk into a bookshop you are confronted with this massive array of beautiful books. Do you have any tips on, you know, what, what, what are the top three things that you, you know, the three <laughs> top ingredients if you were book buying for a younger reader? You talked about something I wouldn't have thought about, like a Mac page. Or what, what, you know, what, what makes a great book for a young reader? So I think probably 
enticing illustrations. I mean, even past primary school readers, we're seeing books that are probably going from around eight or nine all the way up to teen years now have illustrations included in them. I think people have acknowledged that a lot of messages can be delivered through an illustration. And when you watch a young child read a book, they will pour over an illustration for clues to the actual text. That's how yeah. children read and take in messages. Mm. Uh, the other thing I think they like is they like to see themselves in a book. They like to see a child or a character just like them. And they like to see a character like them doing something wonderful. And also I think it's the feel of the book. They like uh, books that, that feel good, that are nice to touch, that are easy to, to read through, you know, a nice font, pretty colours, pretty illustrations. Um, and I think I think I think that's a real winner. Oh, thank you so much. I'm going to because I know everybody's very eager to hear about the happy hedgerow. So I'm going to uh, move on to Eleanor, who's the author of the happy hedgerow and the driving force as well behind Piku Publishing, which specialises in in thoughtful, high quality books for, for young readers. And I know you grew up in the countryside, Eleanor, and have a great love of nature uh, and the, out, out, the out, outdoors. And that shines through in the Happy Hedgerow. So uh, could you tell us a little bit about your book? You're on mute at the moment. No, you're still. We can't hear you at the moment. I'll tell you when we can. Sorry? OK. Yep. Yeah, Stop. okay. Yeah, it was lovely, lovely of Alison to say such enthusiastic things about hedgerows. Um, and yeah, I did grow up in the in in rural Hertfordshire and spent a lot of time outdoors. And um, I think as you grow older, all of those first impressions of nature become even stronger in you. You start to yearn for those early days when you were really um, your senses were fully alive in a sense. And uh, so that I've come back to that uh, passion of na for nature through my children. I think that they really awoke, it, uh, reawakened me to it. Um, but I've always been concerned with nature conservation. That never went away. But I think the slowing down and the noticing definitely came through my children. Um, and um, I, I've always been aware that hedgerows are a, a, a fabulous part of the British landscape. But I was uh, in my... <laughs> nature conservation brain, always um, aware that a lot had been destroyed uh, over the decades and that many were poorly maintained. And then it sort of dawned on me that this was a, this was a topic in itself that perhaps had been overlooked and nobody really talked about hedgerows. And the more I thought about it, the more odd it seemed. And uh, I realised what a huge habitat there were and uh, started reading more about them. So. This is how the, the, the story started to write itself in my head, really. And um, yeah, um, I did a bit of investigation and realized no one had done it. So I thought I would do it. And uh, as you say, in lockdown, we all became a bit creative. And I think it finally, I've always written a little bit on and off and stories in the past, but um, I think this lockdown propelled me to, to finally um, to do it. And so the hedgerow, Happy Hedgerow was born. But, um, yes. Um, and Hertfordshire was under quite a lot of building pressure um, at one point as well. And you were it still is, yes. And I, I was even noticing that in my in my teens, my when my uh, nature conservation brain got switched on, uh, noticing uh, the first thing I noticed was a local field had had gone uh, under concrete. We can say. Um, and my, my town had grown a little closer to the next village. And I think my, it was sparking something in me that, you know, we must protect as much as, of what we have as, uh, as we can. Um, I worked for many years in a publisher in London and uh, was less in contact with nature, wild nature during that time. But my, I was always concerned about nature conservation. And, and so um, here I am back in rural Hertfordshire. And, uh, able to give a bit more time to to these issues and to to writing and uh, I really enjoyed creating the happy hedgerow it was a it was a pleasure and uh, working with Erin as well as as the illustrator was fabulous 
Um, yeah, so I, I, I want to, uh, through, the, through my publishing list and through this book, to, to build that connection be between nature and children. It's naturally there. They are always from the beginning noticing things as soon as they step out of the door, they notice, they smell, they feel, they're, they're an entire sense organ. And um, I think if you show that you understand that about childhood in a book, children recognize it, they see themselves and their sensibilities in it. And then those are endorsed in the book and that builds their empathy. And then from there you have the lifelong memory of a book or a story and this builds stronger adults who become more empathetic as adults. So I, I think it's all, everything is connected in life and, and books can play an important part, a part of, of, of the journey of empathy towards nature. And that's the beautiful front cover. By Erin, yes. <laughs> we have a fabulous designer on, who's worked on the book called Rachel Lawston, and it's very much a team effort. Um, and, uh, but Erin's work, as you can see, she's animated the hedgerow just perfectly um, and brought this, the old oak who sits in the middle of it to life. Um, as everyone will know that's looked at hedgerows, there's often uh, one or two very prominent trees along the length of a hedgerow. And I wanted the oak tree to be watching over his barley field and uh, demonstrating what a fabulous habitat he and the hedgerow were. <laughs> How long did it take you to write the story? And did you find that your knowledge and appreciation of hedgerows grew as, as you went along? Definitely, yes. I, I had to read quite a lot. And I, I read a very interesting article by Amy Jane Beer, who actually gave me a bit of advice on seasonality uh, in the book. And, and she was, uh, she was uh, very useful to me. And uh, she's a, a well-known biologist and writer. Um, but yes, I did have to, have to read quite a lot. And then uh, um, my understanding of hedgerows grew. And then I realized they capture a lot of carbon. So they're very important in cities as well as the countryside. So, yes, I've, I've been learning myself all the way through from very basic knowledge. Um, I'm no expert, but I know a lot more than at the start. <laughs> As I can see here, even on this picture, you know, lots of different birds, uh, species. So you, you must have had to do quite a lot of research along the way. Yes, I did. It, it occurred to me that to write the story effectively, it, it ought to have a certain accuracy to it. And um, it, I wanted it to be a reflection of the natural world. Um, so this is where uh, our designer, luckily, is married to a man called Paul Lawston, <laughs> who is an expert in natural history and works at the London uh, Wildfowl and Wetland Centre. And he helped to guide Erin as to the accuracy of um, some of the species. Erin added a lot of species, which has really brought the book to life. And um, I'm sure that Erin will have researched a lot of it as well. But Paul was there holding our hand and making sure we didn't slip up on the seasons. And uh, um, yes, the correct species are there. And, um, and Amy Jane Beer um, also guided us to, as to seasonality. So it's very much a team effort. <laughs> I didn't have all the knowledge in my head. It had to come from different places to, to bring that uh, authenticity to the illustration and the and the story. And um, was it a long labour of love? No, I, I did it in a few hours. I think I started late afternoon, and by the late evening, it was done. I think yeah. it'd been right. I've been writing it in my head, consciously and subconsciously. I think a lot of people who write do that, and then it just then it starts to. It, when you sit down, it's almost like a fruit that's ripened, and then it just has to. <laughs> it has to appear. <laughs> So I just did it, but then the editing process does take um, a few weeks and you have to bear in mind how much text you can have in a picture book. There's a little bit of cutting and um, some rewording, rephrasings here and there, the normal editorial process. Um, so Jo Collins did a wonderful job. She kept calm all the way through. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, I didn't have to lose too much of the story to get it to fit in 32 pages. So I was quite happy about that. You very kindly said you would read us a short extract. Which I will. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, they, I'll just set the scene then because nobody's seen this. This is the first time the book's actually been seen anywhere. 
it's about to start printing Wait, now. Um, but the, this, the story is set around a barley field uh, with a hedgerow, uh, two hedgerows. There's one hedgerow facing the other. Uh, one has a large oak tree set in it. And in the opposite hedgerow, there is a large beech tree. And they know each other very well because they've been opposite each other for decades. Um, the farmer has become aggravated by uh, the far hedgerow, um, which he has found to be an obstacle to his machines occasionally. So he's decided to bulldoze it, um, bringing the whole barley field into shock. So I'll, I'll, that's setting the scene. Um, by evening, there was no far hedgerow left. Their little field had become a huge field. Only beech remained, head held high. Old Oak tried to quiver his branches gently to reassure his guests, but he was too weighed down to move. The autumn brought cloudy days and strong winds. The top of the soil seemed dry and dusty. It blew across the huge field and disappeared into the distance. That had never happened when the far hedgerow was there. Then it rained for two whole days. Old Oak noticed now how the huge field sloped. The water fell and fell and the soil made a muddy stream. It dribbled over the line where the far hedgerow had once stood, carrying the soil away. Crops need good soil to grow, worried Old Oak, and the soil is leaving. So that, that's one extract, it sounds quite gloomy. <laughs> The story does have a happy ending. So I think it's very important to show uh, a level of optimism and that humans have an impact and we can be positive or negative. And the story ends on a very positive note. <laughs> and do, do you have a, a, this is, it was beautiful. And um, it, it's fine. We're very honored to, to have, you, have the first outing of your, your story, your baby uh, with us this <laughs> evening. Did, I mean, do you have a favourite hedgerow plant or a, an individual favourite hedge near, near where you live or elsewhere? Oh, uh, I, I walk past a hedgerow every time I, I go around the back of my house, which is um, I'm lucky enough to have fields and a wood there. And when I walk there, it's full of slows later in the summer, um, absolutely packed with fruit for free, <laughs> as well as <laughs> plentiful birds. And uh, it's fabulous. Yeah, that foraging aspect is wonderful, isn't it? Not only for wildlife, but for, for humans as well. It is. It's amazing how much fruit you can get for free. It's very much a message I'd like to get out there because, um, yeah, it's not, not everyone can afford fresh fruit all the time. And in the summer, there is plenty of it in the bushes. <laughs> oh, thank you, Eleanor. It's been lovely to hear the story and, and fantastic to see these beautiful illustrations with so many different, um, you know, the wildlife and so on. So I get to, to, to say hello to Erin now, who lives and works on the beautiful island of Jersey and combines her love for hand-drawn lines of very traditional techniques with the flexibility of the new digital world and digital colour. Uh, she says her love of stories comes from her granddad and when she's not in her studio, she can be found baking, which endears her to the tree council team, I have to say, or down <laughs> at the seashore watching the tide roll. So Erin, th things you'd like to share about uh, uh, the Happy Hedgerow and your journey with the Happy Hedgerow. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much for having me on. It's uh, really exciting to be part of. Uh, yeah, uh, my love of books has been been with me all my life. Um, I've been illustrating them now for a few years, and I actually studied fine art, drawing and painting at university. So I come from a, a fine art background, and uh, wanting to illustrate them definitely came from reflecting on my own childhood and books that I loved like Beatrix Potter and Winnie the Pooh and Badger's Parting Gifts. And thinking about it then, these books all have a strong basis in nature and animals. And so then being able to work on a book like The Happy Hedgerow was just super exciting. So I'll tell you a bit about how the illustrations were done. Okay. The first, sorry, the first thing uh, I did 
to begin work was to head out and to get involved in nature and look at all the trees and hedgerows that I could find. Uh, as you met, excuse me, as you mentioned, I'm very lucky that I live on Jersey and there's uh, beautiful landscapes all around and lots of farmland too, so plenty of hedgerows. Uh, if you want to show slide one, I can show a few of my photos for research. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is uh, an incredibly important step. Uh, if someone asks you to think, think of a leaf or think of an oak tree, you can really easily build a picture in your mind. But when you go out into nature, you get to see how they really look. You get to see how unique all the plants and trees are and how they all have their own personalities in a way. And uh, if any of you ever visit Jersey, there's one particular big tree uh, that inspired the old oak in the Happy Hedgerow. It's along the cliff paths near Booley Bay. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> On Jersey as well, over the past two years, there's been a few initiatives to start replanting hedgerows that were pulled up in the past. So it's also been really lovely to see that. And as uh, Elena mentioned, we did a lot of research and uh, we did feel being accurate was incredibly important, especially the changing of the seasons and different migratory birds. So yes, our fantastic designer, Rachel, and was a great help with uh, resources and her husband, Paul, made sure all our birds and creatures were correct and when and where they should be. So if you want to go to slide two, I'll show some of the drawings. So prompted by going out into nature and by Elna's beautiful words, sketches begin and they do start quite basic, as you can see, just establishing the layout of the scene and uh, seeing how it all flows. Uh, this is a really important step because it lets you see if there's anything missing or uh, stuff needs to be added, that kind of thing. And then once the kind of rough layout is approved, uh, you can see then the main image there. If you go to the next slide, I then take it to more finalized art. And uh, it's obviously a lot more complete at this stage. And because actually uh, when drawing out, I draw about two times the size of the original book. So these are on quite large bits of paper. It, really lets me get in and, and get the detail and get all the depth that would be in a real hedgerow. Um, so I felt that was really important to get a sense of vibrancy and interest into all the scenes we could. Um, and as you mentioned, yes, I, I draw traditionally and then uh, scan into the computer to color. So if you want to go to the next slide, there's a comparison of uh, a line art versus the colored. So the reason I color digitally, but still draw traditionally, is that coloring digitally affords you so much freedom. You don't have to worry about ruining your drawing, adding uh, the wrong color or something like that. It really uh, lets you experiment and uh, work quite freely, but I don't think I could ever say goodbye to pencils. There's something there's I just love the feeling of pencil on paper and it feels quite organic and uh, it, I think it helps form ideas as well. So then that's the final art. I send it off to our amazing designer and the words get added and then it becomes a book. <laughs> So, so with this, with the Happy Hedgerow, Erin, what, what were the big challenges of, um, you know, you get the brief and, and what, what did you find were the biggest challenges? Well, when it comes to children's books, especially picture books, uh, a huge amount of effort is put in by so many people and it is a lot of hard work. Uh, just for reference, I'll show on the camera here. Um, this is the uh, majority of the drawings for the Happy Hedgerow. I don't know if you can see those, but the sketchbook 
containing them all weighs about a kilogram at this point. <laughs> um, so that's uh, one challenge. An interesting problem I know we all faced was uh, when I began working on the final art was during lockdown at the start of the year. So getting out into nature wasn't as easy and I really did miss that. So I uh, turned to the happy hedgerow as my little escape into nature, really drawing these scenes. And, uh, and that was lovely. Um, a, a big challenge uh, is as an illustrator, when an author has entrusted you uh, with their story, um, you feel very much like you've been handed something precious. And I can be quite hard on myself in wanting to do that justice and uh, do the best you can because you know just how much hard work and how much heart has gone into the story. I think, I think illustrators and artists will never be pleased 100% with their work, but you just have to deal with that. So that can be a, quite a hurdle. But as, as Elena mentioned, how we, uh, we've all learned so much during this book, uh, maintaining accuracy was something that was really at the forefront of my mind. And uh, I would often realize that the blackthorn I was meant to be drawing somehow now looks a bit like a hawthorn. And then I'd have to redo that. So that was a fun but challenging aspect of this book, but I've learned a lot from it too. I remember when we spoke before, you said that one of the, the tricky things actually was to ensure that the, the oak was friendly and not scary. Um, and did he go through a lot of different iterations? Or Yeah, whenever Elena first approached me about the book, she had we, we had a conversation about how yes sometimes especially in old books when you see tr uh, trees with faces that can be quite creepy or scary so <laughs> keeping him feeling warm and friendly and a home to all these creatures uh really uh was important so I, I did a couple of sketches but I have to, he, he did emerge quite quickly his personality he just 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 keeping in mind that sense of warmth yes he did he did really emerge quite quickly which was a nice nice <laughs> your I look I mean your work um often features shadow and dappled light that seems to be a feature on on some of the different things that I've seen that you've worked on how do you create that and why, why is that is that you know part so much of a part of your work I think it's a uh possibly the fine art background we were always taught now where's your light source coming from that, that, that was always a very important thing to establish when you come to draw so I think it's probably that it's also I think it just appeals to me I really love adding in the light rays and things like that that's also a reason why digital coloring is so powerful because uh you can maybe see on the side by side there, there aren't any light rays on the drawing. The light rays are only on the colored version. So then that's that's kind of, again, the power of, of being able to add that in after the fact and make sure it's all correct. Fantastic. Did you have a, a favorite season? I mean, when, when you look through the book and you see winter compared to uh, some of the other seasons, did you have a favorite season and, and why? Oh, I think it's uh, it's actually this the spread you're seeing, which is uh, I think uh, late spring summer, um, and uh, it's it's the greens, the greens and the yellows, just the color palette, just it's so cheerful and luscious, and uh, there was also um, the flowers and getting to add blossom and things like that. So that was definitely my favorite. Thank you. That's that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to do to, I can see that we do have a number of questions which are coming into the Q and A box. And uh, somebody has asked, what made you decide the oak was a he? Or maybe it was me that called the oak a he. So I'm going to ask Eleanor <laughs> that question. I didn't, I didn't give it a lot of thought, but there was um, a sense in which um, I wanted a strong 
paternal figure, perhaps not very fashionable at the moment, <laughs> but a strong paternal figure um, watching over the field. Uh, I didn't uh, go through a complicated thought process at all about it. That's my honest answer. <laughs> yeah. Alison, any, any thoughts from, from you on um, the importance or otherwise of, of whether what, what an oak tree should be? You're on mute. Yeah, there we go. Um, I just think it's got to be uh, friendly and yeah. approachable and uh, because trees historically have been portrayed as sometimes a scary character um, so I think it's really endearing that this is such a friendly welcoming one that you can get close to so yeah I think I think that's really important but also for it to look like a tree and not look like a Disney caricature of a tree which it does yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That, that was very important to me that we didn't uh, have anything approaching a, a, a Disney style illustration. <laughs> but Erin did a brilliant job straight away. It was amazing, really. How how do you choose an illustrator, Eleanor? Do you do you go through a you know a tender process and a, a, a kind of um, how do how do you do it? I uh, there are um, agencies uh, that um, look after the interests of illustrators. And um, so we did go to one agency that we've used before and see who else was on their books. And uh, and Erin's work caught my eye when I was looking at the way that she portrayed, um, yeah, plants and leaves. And I thought there's something in there that really resonates with how I'd like the book to look. Um, but really we have to, test her in out and ask her for a, how she would draw an oak tree with a face. <laughs> um, yeah, and so it was quickly clear that Erin was going to do a great job. I didn't have any doubts, really. it was perfect. <laughs> I was amazed how much detail she put into that first drawing or, yeah, it was really an artwork on its own that she showed to us. And so it was easy to judge that she was going to do a good job, I think, yeah. Amazing. I mean, I know you just published a book called Finn's Garden Friends, which is uh, mm. a topic, uh, an allotment. I was wondering, when, when you write, um, do you have a city audience in mind or a rural audience? And does it make a difference? Do you, do you think it that has any t take on? That's such an interesting right? question. Um, Finn's Garden Friends, um, was very much a response to the sense that children um, need that need to be connected to nature or to have their feelings towards nature um, shown in a book and endorsed and uh, that connection built. And then um, the, the fact that, that the disconnection is more likely in cities and that the, the sense of bereavement at not being able to access nature could be quite strong in cities. So that book was very much um, about giving hope to, to children in, in cities, as well as the countryside or small towns or um, children that don't get out and about much, but very much wanted to include children's in cities, base it there so they could see what is available to them. Um, if they just look and take a little time and Sometimes you need a friendly adult to, to introduce you, like in Finn's Garden Friends, the granddad takes Finn to his allotment, but it could be a park or just a small scruffy patch near your block of flats, you never know. But uh, that, yeah, so it's very much uh, about um, the direction we're going in is sort of part of our list. We'll be doing that nature connection thing with children, we hope, yeah, if we're successful. <laughs> I wanted to ask, I know both Louise and Alison have been school governors, to what extent books and the school library are ever a focal point when governors get together to talk about things? And our budgets absolutely just continue to be terrible when buying books for schools or? Um, well, the school that Alison and I are governors for where, where our, our children go, um, the school have some quite imaginative 
schemes to try and get books in. Um, one of the ones that I really love that I really appealed to me when we first looked around the school and they mentioned this little scheme is the birthday book scheme. And what happens is when it's a child's birthday um, that they're encouraged, the parents are encouraged to um, buy a book for that child. The child chooses from, from a list and that they're presented with their book at the school assembly and everyone sings happy birthday and they get their book and the teacher says something about the book and what a lovely book it is and all the rest of it. The child takes the book home and reads it and it has a lovely little book plate in it saying this was presented on, you know, little Jimmy's 10th birthday or whatever. And then afterwards they're encouraged to bring the book back and it goes in the school library. So it's a lovely thing for that child. It's a special thing and they get to choose a book for the library. Their mum and dad you know, wow. contribute by by funding and we we tend to buy our books from Alison's shop which is always half price which is great we get good value for money <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it's also lovely then when they when the children bring one of the library books home because quite often it'll have a little book plate in it and it'll be from a previous child's birthday and often it might be a child that they know who's now one of the big kids in school and it might have been their book in reception and it's that quite nice things of, of the books a lot of the books in the library being books that other children have chosen um, and it's also a good way of parents helping the school to, to stop the library. So I really like that, that one that our school does. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lovely idea here from Claire Thompson, who's asked in the questions, will the Tree Council schools get a copy of the book? So I think that's a great idea. I can't promise it, but we'll definitely look at it. Um, I think it, it, would, it, would be, it would be wonderful. And then Loretta Rivet has, has asked, what... Oh, Hang on one second. What age group were you aiming at, Eleanor? Or was it aimed at all from the very young to uh, the adult? Yeah, that's an important question. Um, I, I think a child that's three years old will get a lot out of the illustrations because they're so rich. And as with a lot of books that, that children aren't yet able to read, they can simply enjoy the illustrations. And it's very clear from the illustrations what the narrative, uh, the, the thrust of the narrative. So three years to a hundred years. Great answer. <laughs> and a question for, for Erin. How long does illustrating a book like this take you? There's so much beautiful detail. Yeah, it, uh, it's really, <laughs> how much time can I, can I have? How much detail can I add really? But uh, just to give an answer, so that the, the larger spread you saw earlier uh, with the oak spreading his branches out that one took uh, I think two and a half to three days to draw and then I think a day and a plus or minus half a day to color so it's but it's just getting into and drawing a spread like that is just Sometimes I'll not notice five hours going by, especially when I'm drawing. It's it's really uh, addictive <laughs> getting in there and drawing all the little leaves. And yes, so yeah, a while. <laughs> and how do you feel when that book is in your hands? But I can ask this of both Erin and Eleanor. How do you feel when you see that book in your hands, the finished product? Sometimes when the box of advances arrives from the printer, I circle it a few times without <laughs> opening it. <laughs> Sometimes I leave it a whole day <laughs> because I'm so terrified that something might have printed badly or something might have gone wrong. Um, sometimes I've asked my children to dive in first, <laughs> but when you, it, nothing ever really goes wrong. It's very, very rare. Printers are brilliant and it's so exciting when you start flicking the pages. It's almost unbelievable that it's actually the journey's finished because it's a very long journey. I mean, this book actually, Erin, I think we've taken a year over it, haven't we? I think, I think... My, my first research photos were in November and I think it was October uh, I did the sample so and then I think possibly before that we were chatting so yeah, yeah. a while. <laughs> I think it was yeah from writing it and then there was a process to find you and uh, show it to the mm -hmm. editor so I think it's probably about a year all in once we've got the books which will be next month uh, begin we'll have the advanced copies at the beginning of next month but some books take longer um, and they have to germinate for a lot longer as well before you can really say that you're ready to go, uh, even on the writing process. So it could be a year and a half, two years, some books. 
Um, One of the questions is when when is the book going to be published, which I don't think we've we've talked about yet. It will be published on the second of September, so in time for new school term. Any library buyers listening? <laughs> well, I um, hope that, that the Tree Council um, will be able to do a special offer. We've already spoken about that. It would be lovely absolutely to yes <laughs> um, to those who are attending this. Erin, <laughs> how yes, do you feel? When you have that book in your hand. Yeah, it's it's always quite surreal in lots of ways. And I I'm notorious for looking at a book with my illustrations in it and seeing seeing all the little things I wish I'd done better, but sometimes you just have to shake that off and just just be be proud. So and then yeah. sometimes seeing seeing your book in a shop, that that's for me is a is is the most kind of fulfilling moment and then especially seeing a child read it that just I can't even put words into how that makes me feel <laughs> but yeah oh, a bit surreal always. <laughs> I had a question for Alison you I mean you you are you are an independent bookshop and you hear these these tales of how the big bookshops get paid large sums of money to have a book in a certain position do you do you arrange your books as you wish or um, in, in the shop? Which ones do you put on display? How do you choose? Uh, well, I definitely have a thing for organising them by colour, which is <laughs> really, really, really well received. But it's a little bit of a personal preference there. Um, but we tend to group them by subject. So, for example, we have an area just dedicated to all books to do with nature and animals. Um, so that, that works really, really well. Um, but yeah, we just, we just make sure the ones that we really fall in love with are prominent by the till and uh, that's where they catch people's eyes. Fantastic. So I think just before before we're getting towards the end uh, of, of our um, conversation, I just wanted to ask each of you if you had one wish for the future of young readers and books, what might that wish be? I would like to see in schools that children had plenty of time for reading for pleasure and just browsing books. Um, I think that would be so beneficial. Um, so much is drawn out of a book beyond just the story. You're learning about society, you're learning about empathy, you're learning about how to deal with all sorts of situations. And I think even a lot of class time could be saved if children were just reading books and gathering that those lessons out of books be perhaps a little less complicated and more pleasurable and would form a good habit for life. So for me, more reading for pleasure in schools. Right. Erin, any thoughts? Yeah, my took the words out of my mouth. It <laughs> would be it would be I would wish that that a real passion for reading could be could be uh, taken with them through life because I have books from my childhood that I'll never part with and mm -hmm. uh, I, I I would wish that 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 they could yes like like Elna said get the real joy and pleasure out of books because you know they'll help them uh, tenfold back yeah yeah, yeah. Alison I'm not sure if your your connection wasn't great. So I'm not sure if you're still there. Yeah, I'm still here. I'm just not on the video. <laughs> um, yeah, I just I think seeing schools making time in the the daily timetable for reading. I know a, a local school just in Buckingham. They have something uh, called SAR, which is stop and read. And literally, the pupils and the teachers just stop midway through a lesson. Perhaps if children are getting restless and need to refocus they just stop and read so they stop and pick up a book that's next to them and just share that lovely I can see we've had a question in in from Dave Elwand who says how important do you think it is for children and schools 
to have a chance to meet the author and illustrator. I guess that's been a little difficult over the past uh, year or so, but in, in general. Um, I think it gives children a great thrill to meet an author. I think it brings home that somebody really did create this. <laughs> Um, and it gives them a chance to answer questions. And I think it's also quite inspiring, overused word, but to see that that's a path in life you could take. Mm, if you've got a story in you, why can't you write it? Why can't you publish it? And uh, they can see that the journey is possible, becomes very, very real. But they can ask questions. It's wonderful, wonderful to engage. I think it's like quite an exciting thing. Yeah, I think so I am too. available. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so too. Just uh, children being a, just as a kid who was always drawing, it's then nice to see that, oh, you can, I can do that when I'm grown up too. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Alison, did you want to say something? Um, I've, I pretty much agree with uh, what everyone else has said. Yeah. So I want to thank um, uh, Alison, Eleanor and Erin for sharing their inspiration. I'm using that word again, but uh, <laughs> it is a, a, a truly fantastic book that, that on so many different levels, it's a lovely tale, it's beautifully illustrated, and it's a, a great tribute to nature and the environment and the importance of hedgerows. And it's got a happy ending. Um, although there are some grim moments in it, I have to say. <laughs> so I hope that everybody will get their copy of The Happy Hedgerow. Um, it, this this uh, webinar will be available as a recording afterwards. So if you want to share it with people who you know haven't been able to catch it this time round, uh, we'll be sending around an, an email link later. And we'll also email you with a special offer on The Happy Hedgerow. And we'll have a think about whether how many of our schools we might be able to share the book with, which would be great. There are lots of other conversations coming up this week in our Hedge Talk series. We've got hedgerows and pollinating insects and hedge laying and hedgerows and birds and music and plants. Uh, so so do, do look at the other evenings, come and join us and let's all talk to the hedge. I don't know if you've looked on social media, hashtag talk to the hedge, share your photos, share your stories. We've got some delicious prizes I have to say for some of the winning photographs so it's well worth um, having a go on social media and if you have enjoyed this evening um, there's also if you'd like to pledge a hedge to pledge a meter of hedge if you go to nationalhedgerowweek.org.uk then you'll find what you need to be able to pledge uh, a meter of hedge for yourself or your family or or your <laughs> any, any of your loved ones so thank you again to our fabulous panelists and um, Thank you to the Tree Council team who've been here uh, and have helped set this up and have done so much to make tonight a success. Thank you to all our audience for being with us and we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll say goodbye to you now. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.